The Center for Educational Media and the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University are proud to offer professional development to K-12 educators in Tennessee through our online video library. The following video is presented by the Center for Educational Media in partnership with Professional Educators of Tennessee's Leader U Conference. For more professional development videos, check out our website at cem.mtsu.edu. Welcome everyone to Leader U. I'm Kathy Cobb. I'm the state president of uh, Professional Educators of, of Tennessee. I'm very pleased and honored to announce your keynote speaker today, Graham Hepburn. He's the co-founder of Quavar Music. He heads up all the content development and curriculum alignment as vice president. Graham Hepburn has a passion for igniting a love of music in the hearts and minds of young kids. He received an honors degree in piano performance from the Clowester, is that correct? Clowester? Colchester. Colchester, okay. School of Music. And his musical career has ranged from solo recitals to touring the world for six years as a musical comedy performer. Music is a very important part of his life. As the director of music for the Grindon Hall Christian School in England, his effervescence transformed a quiet program with 20 students to a heralded effort which included a 90-piece orchestra, wow. three choirs, 20 rock bands, a fiddling group of 40 students, and a musical with a cast of 105. That's quite awesome that to start was... from 20 students. So please welcome Graham Hepburn. Thank you. Um, good to see everybody. Um, let's see, just let's see my piano's on. a photo. <laughs> Good, lovely to see you. Now, um, I am doing the keynote speech I've just been told. Thank you, Kathy, for your introduction. I thought Kathy was brilliant. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> Kathy, you're probably one of the best presiders I've ever seen in my life. I shall write a personal letter on quill pen and parchment to the Presiders Association of USA recommending that you move on to level two. Good. Okay, good. So, uh, as you can tell, my name is Graham Hepburn, and as you can tell from my accent, I'm from a place called Alabama. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, I am I'm from a place called Alabama, and um, I'm a bit nervous because I today I I'm, I'm a little bit shaky. I got a taxi here, and I got into the back of the taxi. I leaned forward. I tapped the taxi driver on the shoulder and he went completely crazy, and he nearly hit a pedestrian. He scraped the side of a bus. He pulled in at the side of the road out of breath, and I said, whatever's the matter? He said, don't ever do that again. He said, this is my first day as a taxi driver. For the last 25 years, I've been driving a hearse. <laughs> <coughs> Try and keep up. Okay, good. So it's nice to be here. So if I, if I looked at you and I described you as balanced, you might think, oh man, I'm not sure, I'm not very impressed with that compliment. I mean, I was thinking about my wife. If I took my wife out for a nice meal on a Friday night and we all got dressed up and I took her out to a really nice expensive restaurant and we had starters and main course and dessert and coffee and there was music playing and I leaned forward to my wife and I took her hand and I said, babe, you're very balanced. She would give me one of those looks which would mean, hey, you could have come up with a better thing to say. But we don't like always that word balance, do we? So if you look on TV, you've got like extreme, extreme sports. 
ultimate fighting, the amazing race. And sometimes education can be a bit like that as well. Education swings from extreme to extreme. I don't know whether you've noticed that. I notice you are our teacher of the year and you're nodding all your years. Have you noticed this in education? It goes from extreme to extreme. But sometimes what we need to find is balance. And today's conference is about the whole child. How do we provide a balanced education that makes children into the whole people that they need to be? And um, I run a, I co-created this company, Quaver's Marvelous World of Music. We are based in Nashville. There's about 110 staff and it started 16 years ago when I randomly met a man on a cruise ship in Hong Kong. We became friends and we started Quaver. Our companies are in about 9,000 schools in the US and 36 countries worldwide. And so we are a market leader in music, and we believe that music is part of the balance that students need to help them to become whole individuals in life. So I'm going to talk about the power of music. So a few years ago, um, I, one of our employees knocked on my office door and he said, Graham, would you play at my wedding? And I was like, oh, I'm not sure I've got time. I looked in my diary, and I had time, and I said, I'll play at your wedding. And so we play, we had the rehearsal, played at the wedding, and then a few days later, usually if you play at somebody's wedding, they might buy you a Cracker Barrel gift card or something like that. But he came, he knocked on my door, and it wasn't a Cracker Barrel gift card. He said, Graham, I've bought you this. And it was a hundred year old songbook. And um, this book was published in 1919. And I read on the back of it, and this is what it says. Our endeavor is to present music which interprets life and humanity, love and comradeship, and especially the joy and courageous optimism which make the dominant note of the American people. And if America fulfills her promise, it will be because music has not failed to contribute its share in keeping alive the altruistic feeling which gives vision to life. It's amazing. A hundred years ago, somebody wrote that. And I thought, man, and it inspired me because music is three things. Music touches the emotions. Music makes the mundane memorable. And music lifts us above our circumstances. So when I was about 11, I wanted to watch the movie Jaws. And um, I remember walking down to the uh, shopping centre in, in, in England in my short trousers and looking through the window of Blockbuster Video. Everyone remember Blockbuster Video? Let's have a moment's silence for Blockbuster Video. <laughs> Dearly departed Blockbuster Video, buried alongside floppy disks. So Blockbuster Video, and I remember looking through the window of Blockbuster Video and there was the, the, a scene from Jaws. You know, they used to have those TVs playing on a loop, and it was the man on the dock fishing, and he was fishing, and I was watching, and I thought, this isn't very scary. And then you see the fin come through the water, and then basically eats the man. And I thought, that doesn't look very scary at all. And I went home, and I said to my mum, Mum, because my voice hadn't broken, I said, Mum, um, can I watch Jaws? Because it doesn't look that scary. And she said, that'll be fine. So it just so happened that my parents were out that night. We got the video and it was just me on the sofa in a darkened room watching Jaws. And the same scene came along. This time, I could hear the music. And it's then that I ended up behind the sofa. And, but I thought to myself, what is it that makes that so scary? Why not this? Why not this? This is Jaws going backwards. Um, why? Oh, Jazzy Jaws. This is Jazzy Jaws. Why, why, what is it about that that makes it so scary? I sometimes do school assemblies for students, so all over the place, and um, I describe how I met my wife. And um, when I met my wife, I was on a beach, and I was in my Speedos, and I was rippling my muscles, covered in baby oil, and my wife was over the other side with her long blonde hair, just kind of doing her thing. And I remember looking across at my wife, and I did, excuse me, I looked across at my wife and did my kind of, 
And she looked across at me, and our eyes met, and she went, <laughs> like that. And I looked across at her, and I was like, <laughs> and we started running towards each other on the beach in slow motion. And I was running like this, and she was running like this, and I was running like this. And we eventually met in the middle. Now, I tell students that true story of how I met my wife, and I say, what music would accompany that scene? Is it this? And they all go, no! It's not that, is it this? And they say, no. And then I say, is it this? I say no. And then I say, is it this? And they say yes. Now, I've got three children and I've never said, let's have a movie, movie night and let's watch Love Story. They've never seen it. All the kids that I do this to have never seen the 1971 movie Love Story, which has this as its theme. None of them have seen it. So why do they pick that piece of music? Why is Jaws so scary? Because music is like a donut. Inside every donut, there's jam, and inside every note, there's emotion. And music touches emotion like no other subject can do. That's why it needs to be in schools. 50 years ago, if you wanted to teach, teach general education in New York from pre-K through first grade, you had to be able to play the piano. Now, sometimes we throw these things out and we say, oh, that's, that's old-fashioned. But there was reason for it. Because music is a powerful way of touching the emotions and causing students to remember things. So, <clears throat> we need it. In fact, when I, when I left the house today, my wife said to me, she was, she was lying in bed and I walked out in my outfit and she said, uh, good luck with the speech. She said, you're my main squeeze. And I thought, that's really nice, but shouldn't I be your only squeeze? <laughs> and I've been disturbed. I was driving. I was like, maybe there's somebody else that's a squeeze. I need to talk to you. I'll, I'll email you and let you know what happened. Um, so music touches the emotions. But music also makes the mundane memorable. My daughter is called Maisie. Um, she came home from school a couple of years ago on Halloween. And her teacher had given her a pumpkin. And she came home and she said, Hey, Dad, because she's got an American accent, she said, Hey, Dad, I got a pumpkin. Is that how you say, how do you say pumpkin? Right. Say again? That's right. That's right. <laughs> that, that, I don't quite understand what you mean. Um, pump, say pumpkin. Pumpkin. Pump. Pumpkin. Pumpkin. How'd you spell that? P U K N. A puckin. She got a puckin. She brought a pumpkin home from school. And I said, Oh, that's really good. I love your pumpkin. It's really nice. She said, Dad, what do you want me to do? I said, You can put it anywhere you like in the house, anywhere you like. And so she thought for a bit and she decided that she would put it on the doorstep in the middle. So when you open the front door, there was the pumpkin in the middle of the door. And so when we had to go out like shopping or anything like that, you had to sort of just step over this pumpkin for about two weeks. And because I'm English, I think my neighbors thought it was some kind of strange English tradition. And I could see them looking out of their windows thinking, there he goes again. <laughs> stepping over the pumpkin. And so we'd all kind of line up and step over the pumpkin and it would be a slightly weird experience. Anyway, my son, who's called Oliver, who's a little bit like me, he said, Dad, you've got to jump the pump. And I was like, that's good. You've got to jump the pump. So after a couple of days, we'd all stand there and be like, jump over this pumpkin and then go out. And our neighbours thought we were even stranger. So we would jump in the pump. And then as we would come into the driveway, my son would say, Dad, you've got to jump the pump. And then I started to say, you got to jump the pump. Here we go. You got to jump the pump. Clip along. Click along. Here we go. You got to jump the pump. So as we came in to our driveway, you got to jump. So we'd all line up singing, you got to jump the pump, a little move, and we'd jump over this pumpkin. Yeah, you can stop now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. Some of you need to get out more. Um, the, you got to jump the pump. 
It made something that was quite mundane quite memorable. And that's what music does. It not only touches the emotions of students, it actually makes the mundane things of life memorable. I was speaking in New York a couple of weeks ago, and I was talking, we, we are designing a social and emotional learning curriculum. So not only are we creating music for music teachers to teach music in its own right, but also our belief is that music should be used in general education because it adds something that nothing else can add. And so we've written about 50 songs in the last few a couple, year or so that express social and emotional learning. And I was talking about this in New York, and a guy came up to me. He said, I'm a, general, I'm a, I'm a classroom teacher. He said, hey, your talk has inspired me because I've been playing the guitar for years, and I've never brought it into my classroom. And I was like, whoa. Bring it in. Make the mundane memorable, even if you can just play one chord. If you could do that in your class, your students would think you're a genius. Your students will not in 30 years' time say to you, write a letter to you and say, I'm not sure that you sang quite in tune when I was in kindergarten. I didn't like the way your voice sounded in kindergarten. What your kids will look back on is the fact that you did it that you tried, that you sang, that you moved, that you did orange justice in front of them, that you <laughs> did the floss in front of them. Can you do the floss? Yes, you. You can do the floss. That's... No, you can't do the floss. Can you or can't you do the floss? Okay, it, this is the floss. <laughs> It's about, with the arts, it's about doing and trying and having a go at doing it. Music makes the mundane memorable. Imagine if Michael Jackson was just a poet and he wrote this. Don't blame it on the sunshine. Don't blame it on the moonlight. Don't blame it on the good times. Blame it on the boogie. <laughs> it doesn't really make much sense, does it? It's very strange. But if you add music to it, okay, you've got to click along. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, here we go. And Do my Michael Jackson here, okay? So just be prepared, it's going up high. Don't blame it on the sunshine, don't blame it on the moonlight, don't blame it on the good times, blame it on the boogie. It sounds a lot better with the music, right? Because music makes the mundane memorable. So music touches the emotions. Music makes the mundane memorable. And also, music lifts us above our circumstances. So at this wedding that I was playing piano for, we had a rehearsal dinner, or whatever you call it in America. And we were there, and the bridesmaids were there, and like the, the bride and the groom were getting nervous about you know, how it was going to work out, and you know, who's walking down the front first, and all that kind of stuff. And um, it was kind of a nice time, and the bridesmaids were making their, giving their ideas and talking about it. And then one of the ladies, actually, she works for our company, um, she said, oh, this is lovely, isn't it? We're all together, we all know each other, let's sing Kumbaya. And so they all started singing Kumbaya. And because I played a piano, I kind of joined in.
And it was as if the atmosphere in the room changed and the music lifted us out of our circumstances into another place. And if we need that, how much more do our students need that as well? How many times does a student come to us and tell us something that we think, wow, something that's going on at home, something that's going on in their life, something they can't understand. Sometimes students are coming into school and they can't really even concentrate on knowledge or learning because so much is going on at home. And so as teachers, we have to sort of unpick that and then they've got the ability to sort of let go of it in their mind and learn. I sometimes think I had a great upbringing and so do my kids have a great upbringing. But imagine, Graham, imagine if you came into school and the night before you had seen your dad just walk out of a room and slam the door and shout, I'm never coming back. Imagine it. Could you sit and learn math? Could you sit and write a sentence with a full stop and capital letter? No. Even when I fall out, have an argument with my wife, sometimes I get to work and I'm like, oh man, I can't, I've, got, I've got to get that right. I've got to put that right before I do anything. And sometimes the kids cannot do that. And so music can lift them out of their circumstances. It can take them and lift them out of it for that split second, for that moment. And they think, oh, wow. It's like a magic carpet ride that they can get on and the music can take them and it can take them out of their circumstances and they need it and you need it and we all need it. Music lifts us above our circumstances. <clears throat> There's a famous, uh, some of you might have seen uh, 60 Minutes. There was a 60 Minutes show. Well, actually, I'll tell you something else. I was a teacher in, uh, in England, in a kind of Harry Potter style school in England. And I would look out my first floor window and I would see all these kids coming into school. And a lot of them had like hoodies on with earbuds and they were coming to school and they, were, they would walk like that and it was kind of cool. But they never wanted to be in my orchestra. They didn't want to be in my band. They didn't want to be in choir. But I knew they loved music. music. In fact, some of them loved music more than the kids that were in my choir and my band. And I thought, man, I've got, to, I've got to really see if I can motivate these kids. And there was this kid called Dale. And every day he would come in with his hoodie, with his headphones on. And he was smaller than all the other kids. And he was one of those kids that would never look you in the eye. Maybe you've seen kids like that. that. Something's happened, something in them that they can't... And he would always look at me there. I think I always thought, maybe he thought my chest was really muscular, but I don't think it was that. And he couldn't look me in the eye. And I was like, man, I've got to motivate Dale. And so I set up all these rock bands. And I said, Dale, I wondered if you would like to speak, sing in one of my rock bands. And he's like, oh, Mr. Hepburn, I'm not sure I... But when you're a teacher, you want to try and pull. Don't you see something in a student and you think, can I pull it out of them? That's the, that's the joy of it. Can I pull it out of them? And I said, Dale, I think you can do it. And so I said, all right. He went to the first rehearsal and they were doing a White Stripes piece. And they all started to sing. And the first rehearsal was terrible. And the second rehearsal sounded a bit better. And it's a bit better and a bit better. And then I decided to hire a theatre, 2000 seat theatre. And I did a rock band show. There's about 20 rock bands in it. And I remember the night where I was the MC and I said, ladies and gentlemen, Here's Dale. And Dale walked out onto the stage and he had this kind of cool t-shirt that as you sang, the lights sort of lit up on it like a graphic equalizer. I always remember, it's really cool. And Dale came on and he sang his White Stripes piece and everyone cheered. And I'd seen Dale because he lived in my town and he would hang around in the park and he would sit up on top of this big container and he would just waggle his feet and he would smoke and all kinds of stuff and he just nobody cared about him. But that night, in front of 2,000 people, he picked up the mic and he sang. And everybody stood and they said, whoa, this kid is amazing. And the day when I left school, after everybody had gone home, and I was picking up all these uh, musical neckties that people had bought me, I remember there was a knock on the door. And there was Dale coming in. And he looked up at me with tears in his eyes. And he said, Mr. Hepburn, thank you. Because the music lifted him out of his circumstances. It lifted him. In 1940, there was a very famous composer called Olivier Messiaen. And Messiaen was captured by the Nazis. He's a French composer. He was captured by the Nazis and put into a concentration camp. 
And um, he, he realized that if he could write a piece of music, it might help the people that are in there. And so he managed to get friendly with one of the guards and to get some manuscript paper. And they smuggled the manuscript paper to him. And he started to um, write a piece of music. He got hold of an old cello, a broken clarinet, a violin, and they had a piano in the camp. And he wrote a quartet called the Quartet for the End of Time. And on January the 15th, 1945, under grey leaden skies in the middle of Germany in a concentration camp, all of the prisoners shuffled to the middle of the camp and they sat down. And for 40 minutes, they listened to Olivier Messiaen's piece called The Quartet for the End of Time. And Messiaen says about that moment, he said, never was I listened to with such rapt attention. As the music took them and suddenly it lifted them out of where they were, out of their circumstances, out into another place for 40 minutes. So music touches the emotions. Music makes the mundane memorable and music lifts us above our circumstances and that's why we need it we need it in our schools we need it not only in our schools but in our own lives because it's something completely different something completely different that we can do i want to play you a song so i told you that our company is just down the road and like i said it started 16 years ago when i randomly met a guy on a cruise ship in Hong Kong, and he was a passenger, and he was playing this piece. Um. And I was listening, and I said, hey, I really like that piece, what is it? And he said, well, I wrote it myself. And I said, well, how about if I write it down and play it in one of my concerts? And I, so he said, oh, that would be fine. So. The next day, I said to the audience, hey, uh, one of the passengers has written this piece of music, and I played it. And he really liked it. And then the next day, he came up to me with a contract. And the contract was to write 50, he had 50 pieces. And he said, would you write and arrange all my pieces for me? And I was flabbergasted. And I said, OK. And that one chance meeting led to the whole of Quaver's marvellous world of music. And it's been an amazing and exciting journey. But at the heart of it is this. We believe that music can make a difference in the lives of young people. And so, as I said, we've been working with social and We are creating a social and emotional learning curriculum for classroom teachers. And this is one of the songs we've written. It's called Unique. And Dr. Schwinn mentioned it in her speech that it talks about the uniqueness of individuals. So have a watch and see what you think. Stand up, take a good look in the mirror. Tell me who, who do you see? Keep your head up, reflect on who you are. Yeah, that's you, you, bold as can be. Every feature on your face, your ears, your eyes, your nose, your teeth are as perfect as can be. So sing, I'm brave, I'm strong, I'm loved, I'm smart, and I'm unique. And there's no one else in the whole wide world exactly like me. a little bit louder. louder the world is waiting on your voice be true true to what you have to say you know you've got the power but only you can make the choice to do do it your own way the world's a noise to you
there's no one else in the whole wide world, wide world. exactly like me. Thank you. So please, please come and talk to us. Please come and talk to us. Oh, you're taking a picture. There you go. We'll make that into a calendar, January, February. Um, the, please come and look at our booth. But not just ours. There's lots of other people here. This is not, the, uh, my keynote is not about our company necessarily. It's about all of the people that are here to help us with this job of making education balance to reach the whole child. Thank you for your time. And oh, we've got some lots of Quaver people here, so if you want to talk to them, you can. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>